This is uh, this session I'm particularly excited about. Um, I've only been with the Bieber Institute for barely three months, and getting to know these next two folks that are on the panel has been really, really lovely, a lovely part of coming onto the job. And, you know, just a few weeks ago, Zach gave me the most amazing rundown of uh, the issues in Montana with beavers and wetland, and I, uh, I know I have so much to learn from both of them. So it's been my pleasure to introduce from the Animal Welfare Institute uh, our two panelists that are going to join Mike, um, Zach Strong, who is Senior Staff Attorney with Animal Welfare Institute. His work focuses on protecting and conserving terrestrial wildlife through litigation, legislative and regulatory reform, and promoting human wildlife coexistence. He received a BA in Environmental Studies from Dartmouth College and a JD from the University of Montana School of Law. Alison Lutke is a policy advisor at Animal Welfare Institute, where she has managed an extensive federal and state legislative portfolio for over two years. She lobbies on issues related to marine mammal conservation, shark finning, fisheries management, endangered species, and human wildlife coexistence. Allison received a BS in natural resources conservation and a BA in journalism from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She received her MS in animals and public policy from the Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine at Tufts University and completed her master's externship with AWI. Um, so, and Mike doesn't need any introduction, so welcome these three to the stage for our panel discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adam. And thanks to Zach and Allison who have joined me up here. We're, we're here just to get the ball rolling. You know, if you th think about it, we have a unique opportunity here. I don't think ever has there been a grouping of so many people with beaver expertise as we have right now. Um, and so what this session's about is not about us. We're just going to start the ball rolling. This is about engaging everyone in this room and getting ideas and throwing out questions and just getting the ball rolling for how we can move forward. You know, we're, mo we're moving forward as we already, but we're at the point where we have so many different people and organizations that are engaged in helping with uh, getting beavers recognized for the valuable contributions that they give us. And now the more we can organize, we can use those energies uh, collaboratively and prevent redundancy and really start making even more of an impact th that we need to make. Because as we all know, all know with climate, time is running, you know, we're, <laughs> we're behind the times and we need to uh, pick up what we are doing. And the faster we can engage the public and policymakers uh, and get actual uh, more coexistence pro uh, pro projects out there the better so what 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 i want to uh do is just we're, we're recording this so all the ideas are going to be um saved and we're going to go around and you know raise your hand when you you know get any comment or question that you have um you know we want to hear and it's just kind of a brainstorming you know what types of things that are working for you what things don't work? What what kind of things do we need to look at on a national level, and, or and regional level? You know, the whole whole country is diverse, both uh, the people and the uh, geographies. So one one size doesn't fit all. But that's what this is about. And what we're hoping is that after getting this dialogue going, we'll have ideas for to follow up after the conference and keep keep going and starting what we're thinking of, you know, the national dialogue that uh, Brenda was talking about with, uh, with NAM, uh, we want to build on that and just to help to get us all being more effective. So, uh, you know, we're envisioning that there'll be, vol people can volunteer to work on different areas that are of interest to them, whether that's uh, policy issues, certainly that's a huge issue across the country with the, the myriad of different regulations that affect beaver, uh, beaver work, you know, uh, 
research, education, dealing with the media and getting uh, word out, uh, trainings. These are some, just some of the ideas, how to find federal funding and other funding, collaborations, uh, as I said, to reduce redundancy and engaging youth and more. You know, that's, so let's come up with more and, fo and then we can prioritize afterwards and see who wants to work on what. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Zach to... Uh, Allison first. <laughs> Thanks, Zach. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so I thought I'd just set the stage by... Um, oops, sorry, am I holding this right? Okay. <laughs> that I'd just set the stage um, by kind of discussing the congressional side of things and giving a brief overview of the federal grant program that... AWI has been working on for managing human beaver conflicts with non-lethal methods um, and just touch upon the response we've gotten from congressional offices. Um, and then Zach will kind of elaborate further on that. Um, and I'd also just like to acknowledge that so many of you in this room have been just instrumental in developing this idea and we are immensely grateful for your expertise and for all of your input and feedback. So we could not have developed this without you all and really looking forward to working with everyone. Um, and so just some background on this. Um, so we modeled this um, program after the Wolf Livestock Demonstration Program, um, which some may be familiar with. That was established in 2009 and is overseen by Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, one important facet is that it offers federal assistance to producers for implementing non-lethal methods when dealing with livestock loss due to predation. Um, so we envision this grant program functioning similarly um, with eligible grant recipients, including state agencies, um, local governments, um, landowners, tribes, conservation groups, and so forth. Um, our bill language proposes a five-year program that would authorize a million dollars a year for this pro um, grant program. Um, we've also, thanks to the conversations with many of you here, included a 75% 25 um, cost share in which 75% would be federally funded, 25 would be um, the responsibility of the grant recipient. Um, and then just to say that if our proposal does gain traction, which we think it will, um, we envision expanding it to include all sorts of other related efforts that have been mentioned throughout the conference, including education and training, BDAs, relocation, and restoration. Um, and just some background on the work we've been doing. So we've met with dozens of congressional offices from states including California, Washington, Missouri, Mississippi, the Carolinas, um, Illinois, Massachusetts. Um, we've also met with congressional committee staff of relevant committees as well as appropriations committees, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service agency staff, conservation groups, and tribal representatives. Um, over 100 small businesses and many groups here have uh, signed on to an endorsement letter that we've been using with legislators, which has been invaluable because one of the first questions we get when we go to offices is, who in my state supports this idea and who's going to benefit from it? Um, and so I'll just put in a little um, promotion here that if you'd like to endorse or sign on, there's a sign-on sheet at AWI's table out there. Um, and if you want any more information on this, Zach and I are always happy to chat and we can share our emails after this um, and so kind of back to the lobbying aspect of things uh, I jokingly like to say that um, if anyone has ever seen the schoolhouse rock how a bill becomes a law it's very it's not super accurate as to how things happen in theory I wish it was that simple um, but it's been increasingly difficult to move legislation as standalone bills, to move them forward individually. And so much of our strategy when pitching this idea has been to try and attach it to larger bills that have been moving, such as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Package or the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, just passed the House yesterday. Um, we haven't had success yet, but continue to look for opportunities. Um, we've also had some trouble in that airdropping just an idea into these larger packages is has been received some pushback um, we are focusing on getting a standalone bill introduced which can serve both as a messaging tool and serve us when we are trying to attach this idea to larger packages and bills um, I'll also just note that a really important aspect of congressional support is bipartisanship um, in an increasingly polarized climate, that is challenging, but we think a lot of aspects of this program have the opportunity to gain bipartisan support, and so we continue to 
move forward on that. Um, a la lastly, another prong of our strategy has been um, the appropriations process and creating kind of a pared down version of this program. Um, that's the process by which Congress um, every year funds the government. And so in essence, these bills technically do need to move, although they don't always move quickly, I'm sure as, as people are familiar with. Um, but we've created kind of a pilot program, so a three-year program um, for a million dollars a year that would um, to be secured through the appropriations process. Um, it, this is not a permanent solution as most of these directives um, generally only last for one fiscal year, although you can put in um, directives that are longer than a year. However, it would be an opportunity to show that show results and show interest and that could be um, great and supportive of codifying this idea into a to law and a grant program. Um, and so just, I would say it's, ex it's really been exciting to learn about beavers over the past year. And so great to talk to all of you all and thank you for being so welcoming to us. Um, we've gotten some great feedback from offices. It's been really exciting to just have staff reach out on their own and ask, you know, what's up with beavers? We got an email the other day, what's going on with beavers? So I think part of this too is just really socializing beavers on the federal level because they are so often handled on the state level as they're not endangered or vulnerable, so you don't often hear a lot about them. And so staff are enthusiastic, we're enthusiastic, and um, we're looking forward to chatting more about this Beaver Working Group. Um, I'll hand it over to Zach. Well, thanks, Allison, uh, for the great summary, and, and thanks, Mike, for inviting us to help you kick off this discussion about a National Beaver Working Group. It's a really exciting idea, um, and I'm happy to offer a few thoughts uh, based on Allison's and my experience uh, that might help inform its development. Um, first, I want to reiterate what Allison said about how much we've appreciated and benefited from consulting with several people and organizations here in the room today and, and beyond um, about our proposal. Um, their feedback and their help made our draft legislative language stronger, um, improved our uh, sign-on letter, and, and strengthened our, our overall approach to our advocacy. So we really appreciate that, and I think it speaks to how valuable it would be to establish a national working group where practitioners and advocates could come together in that way. and. Uh, share ideas and exchange experiences. Uh, and I think a, a working group would have the, the added value of keeping our national beaver community more regularly connected instead of many of us having to rely on, uh, you know, waiting a year or two for amazing conferences like these to come around. <coughs> um, regarding uh, improving beaver policies generally, um, we would encourage a national working group to keep Congress in mind, uh, despite you know many of the ways we see dysfunctionality in Congress. We we really think there is a, an opportunity in Congress, um, particularly with respect to funding uh, to support the work that so many of us do. Um, of course, the key is is education. In many of the meetings that Allison and I have had with congressional staff, um, it's been clear that they were largely unaware of the ecological benefits of beavers, issues surrounding beaver conflict prevention, um, and even the efforts that their own constituents uh, are engaged in, in in promoting beavers and beaver presence. Uh, and so, you know, I think another important role that a working group could play would be to develop educational materials, uh, provide those materials, uh, and communicate them directly to members of Congress, and in that way um, ensure that Congress becomes better informed about beavers and, and why, we, uh, why we want and need them to thrive. Uh, and I think that, that putting beavers more squarely on the radar of Congress would help uh, improve our chances of securing favorable uh, beaver policies down the road. Uh, third, with respect to specific policies, um, you know, we would really encourage the working group to, to focus uh, 
uh, at least a, you know one in one area uh, on um, non-lethal on funding for non-lethal conflict prevention. That's kind of where we landed as a place to start, and we think that's strategic and relatively low-hanging fruit in terms of a congressional ask for a few reasons. Um, one, as Allison mentioned, there's already precedent for those kind, that kind of program at the federal level uh, with respect to non-lethal funding for non-lethal ways of coexisting with other species. Um, in addition, since beavers and beaver conflicts occur throughout the country, that's kind of a, a universal, uh, has universal relevance to uh, lawmakers and their constituents across the country. Uh, and also, conflict prevention itself tends to be a relatively neutral, nonpartisan issue. Um, we've met with offices in both parties that have agreed with us that it makes sense to uh, support the use of effective measures to protect property and help communities and uh, at the same time maintain habitat for wildlife. And then lastly, just a couple of thoughts on you know additional um, additional research uh, needs that a national working group could um, assist with. Uh, one, as has come up many times, could be researching and compiling and sharing uh, what funding resources are currently out there uh, in terms of uh, at, at the federal, state, and, and local levels. You know, what programs does the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, NRCS, other federal agencies offer that we could creatively, creatively leverage uh, to support beavers. What types of programs exist at state and federal, at state and local levels in, in various parts of the country? Um, and lastly, and I know this is something that, that the Beaver Coalition is looking at, uh, that, that Mike's Beaver Corps graduates have had to figure out and that has come up a number of times uh, during the conference as well is is what are the various federal and state and local uh, legal barriers to installing flow devices and BDAs and other in-stream conservation measures? Um, what sorts of permits and approvals are, are necessary from place to place? Um, what sorts of fish passage laws exist uh, in, in different states? And, and is there a way of compiling those requirements and, uh, and um, compiling them into sort of, if possible, concise descriptions and, um, and, and, and explanations of how to navigate them, uh, which I think would be really valuable for practitioners across the country. So those are a few thoughts about how we think a, a, a national working group could add value. Um, thanks again, Mike, for raising the idea and, and look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Thanks, you both. Now we can get off the stage. Yay! So now we're opening it up to all of you to just uh, throw out ideas of what uh, you know, what works for you, what doesn't work for you. Um, for it to try to keep it flowing well, both Adam and I are going to spread out, and so when someone's getting when someone's talking, f please keep your hands up so we're ready to go with the next microphone when um, when the first person starts stops. I mean, all right. So if anyone has something they want to share, you know, it, it can be uh, even. I think this is a stupid idea. <laughs> you know, whatever, whatever, uh, whatever is on your mind. Um, from the consulting side of things, uh, we do a lot of restoration and mitigation framework. Um, I, I love this, but there are some significant hurdles to doing more restoration like this, messy, dynamic, everything else, in that mitigation framework, and that's something I think this group would be fantastic at looking at addressing, taking to Congress, nationwide permit, something to, to, to move that process forward, because that's a huge regulatory and financial driver to doing restoration all over the place uh, that is somewhat untapped to being able to implement these these processes thanks thanks one one thing i didn't mention was we're 
you know, thanks to the magic of our AV crew, everything's we're recording, you know, as we have all the presentations, which will which will all be available to everyone here down the road. Um, and we will be going through what, it, you know, what's said and sharing the ideas and c continuing this dialogue after the conference. And I, uh, I just want to share also that I will be creating a spreadsheet um, that I'll make open for people to add ideas to. So, you know, as we come away from this, if there are things that come up or things you want to respond to, um, it doesn't have to be like at the moment, but we just want to get this started to, to hear the voices. So, um, yeah, anyone, anyone else would like to talk? Okay, well, of course, I have a big list of ideas. <laughs> so, um, first of all, I think we need a, like a PR strike force. So every time there's a stupid article about how beavers are causing climate change by colonizing Alaska, there's a letter that goes to that editor explaining why, why that's not true. And also, every time somebody posts in a panic on the beaver management forum about how um, someone, you know, some park district is trying to kill their area's beavers that we that somebody reaches out to them immediately with resources so that they can start their advocacy i also think it would be great if we had more quantification of more dollar quantification of the ecosystem services that beavers provide in a format that can be shared with policymakers, as well as quantification of how flow devices save money over the medium term and um, so the woman who was speaking today from Fish and Cows was talking about how they studied um, current attitudes about um, beavers. I think we should do that. I think we should put mo money into studying different regions of the country and different attitudes. And, um, well, you know, we probably need to do more grant writing to get more funding to fund flow devices. Okay, those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Addressing that, I think Mary O'Brien, when she was with the Grand Canyon Trust, did a study on actual dollar benefits to farmers downstream uh, when beavers were upstream. There are resources, I think. I mean, there are resources, right? There was a report that just came out from a European study this year about ecosystem services, and there's one from Oregon. I just think we need to like collate them and put them in a really digestible format. Speaking to your idea about um, more of a, this national working group having a, a survey uh, to get the you know different regional perceptions. Um, that's a really good idea in terms of with, uh, say, waterfowl or even birders. Uh, we have a national survey, and if states want to uh, be able to speak more to their um, communities, they can uh, pitch in money to then oversample for that so that they can not just take the national numbers but then also apply it. So that may be something to kind of build off your idea that if certain states or regions want to do that, then they could invest a little bit more. So. I think that's a valid idea. Just a note, uh, since, just just to note, since we are going to be recording this, we want to attribute ideas, uh, like like Frank Nelson here, that uh, just to stand up and say your name, just introduce yourself, so that we can make sure that we're crediting and we know who to reach out to um, as we stitch this all together. Me? Okay, I guess I'm the first one to do that. I'm Allison Zach. I want to piggyback off of both of those ideas about um, getting more of the social science going around human perceptions of beavers. Um, I think there could be like a little small subset of us. I know I'm one of the maybe two anthropologists here at BeaverCon. Um, just keeping in mind that those, those efforts to be really applicable and effective need to be like super local or regionally focused. So making sure that that's a goal if that is included. Hi, I'm Chris Sorflatten. Um, how many of you saw my talk yesterday? Show of hands. Okay. Wow. Whole bunch of people. Okay, so uh, 
I, t I talked about a whole bunch of stuff yesterday. It went over pretty well, I think. But just to review it real quick. <clears throat> okay. We need, we need studies. We need scientific studies, right? I've got a little list of studies here. Are beavers more important? Are saving beavers more important than fighting COVID? We just spent a trillion dollars on COVID. Beavers are a whole lot more important than that, I think. Solves climate change, you know. Uh, how many people are going to die from climate change over the next hundred years? You know, a lot more than COVID. Um, can beavers lower the ocean? There's a good study. That's I've looked into it. It looks like they can. Economic analysis of turning all states into tourist states. I'll bet you it would be a boon economically to stop farm, you know, all the corn and soy. Like, what are we even doing that for? Like, why don't we have tourism instead? An economic analysis of undredging the, the Russian and American rivers in California to bring back rain to the arid west. And that one's a fun one because... All you'd have to do is blast one of the gold-bearing mountains there, and it'll fill in the rivers and pay for itself with all the gold, right? <coughs> okay, grants. Whole we need like a team of grant writers. I happen to know a team of grant writers, and it's a really it's a real tough job to write these big grants. I think it, it takes about ten grand, ten thousand dollars to write like a $3 million grant or a $50 million grant. It's grant writers need to be paid well, right? Um, legislation, we covered that. Lawsuits. Why don't we start suing people or the government? It's just law why don't we do lawsuits? They're expensive. Okay. PR. And the last thing is we need a cartoon show for kids. How many of you have seen my logo for my business logo? <laughs> Anyone? Raise your hand. <laughs> um, <coughs> so I got it designed by Bonita Versch. She's the lead animator for Hanna-Barbera. She did Rugrats and the Smurfs and everything, and, and she wants to do it. But uh, we need $10,000 to do a three-second clip, and then we'll use the three-second clip to raise money, $100,000 to do a 10 second uh, You know, it's like... <laughs> anyway, I could go on and on for hours, um, but I'll stop right there. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'm Amanda Allenbach, um, and I guess kind of piggybacking off of like the research side, um, and I don't know if there's like already a platform for something like this, but like you never hear about research until it comes out like two and a half years or more later. And it's like, I think it'd be really cool to have almost like a platform where you can have students or, you know, researchers put in like an abstract that you can know what they're working on. And it's like, I'm a graduate student now and I had ideas and then I'd be like, oh, I want to do this. And my advisor's like, no, that was already done. Or it's currently happening. And I'm like, well, shit, I didn't know that. So it's like, It'd be really cool to just know that people are working together and then you collaborate on top of that and hopefully like get more people involved and that'll just include to more communication like worldwide. Good idea, thanks. Alexa Whipple, and it's just a direct response is ResearchGate. Check it out. There's all kinds of great stuff on there. It's not all published. Lots of published things. Sometimes you have to request texts. Especially, and it's a great place if you're going on Wiley or something as a non-student and don't have access to all the publishing houses. Um, Google Scholar has a ton, and get it'll help you find it, but then you all you can't often get the whole text. So go on ResearchGate, and you usually can with just a polite request to the lead author or responding author. So, um, hi, my name is Lily. I am a student from Idaho, and I'm with the Youth Salmon Protectors. Um, I thought that to kind of create a lasting impact for um, 
a kind of group like this, it would be a really cool idea to get students involved. Um, I had a great opportunity to be able to come this year um, to BeaverCon and help out and present and all that stuff. So I think giving an opportunity to a wider group of students would just allow like the new generation to be brought up in this group. And it, this would also allow teachers and parents to be introduced as well, maybe in a situation where they normally wouldn't be. Hi everybody, um, I'm British, <laughs> so I, I just wanted to say that I have had the privilege of working both over here in the States and also on the other side of the pond, and we are facing exactly the same dichotomy over there as well, and we are currently struggling with the ideas of putting together a, a, a national working group and dealing with these exact same issues, and I just wanted to say um, that I think a lot of us in this room perhaps maybe struggle with the idea that you know we work for sort of small local underfunded projects and yet are expected to deliver huge results and each of us perhaps may have been trained in in a single discipline a lot of us may be ecologists here or perhaps hydrologists or even social scientists anthropologists and yet due to funding constraints and you know huge like passionate objectives to achieve massive goals we are then expected to become masters of, of all of these when um, perhaps being a jack of all trades and being under-resourced, we're not able to deliver those goals. So I, I think this is a fantastic idea to bring everybody together so that we can network as perhaps our psychologists don't perhaps know the best ways of interacting with youth groups, schools, um, other community groups, farmers, other people from disciplines that we really have struggled to identify with. So. Congratulations on getting you guys all together, and I wish you well, and you're very inspirational for all of us, so thank you. Cool. Um, my name is David Fulton Beale, and I would just like to put in a plug for uh, seeking out and including traditional ecological knowledge as we build these resources and, um, you know, work on these issues. Hi, I'm Sandy. Um, I am a forester by training. I work for a land trust now, so I kind of have my feet in a couple of different worlds. Um, I wanted to just put a plug in for um, inviting um, foresters, um, farmers, other stakeholders to this sort of, um, to this um, group or to the working group. I don't know if there's any other forest managers here, but the worlds that I walk in with forest management, beavers are, they are not thought about in any other way than a pest generally. And I'm hoping that's going to change. I'm hoping to work on that issue, but I think that um, bringing those kind of other resource managers to the table um, very deliberately would be very helpful in the discussion. Um, Brian Hummel, I wanted to uh, tag on to that forestry comment, and there are people in forestry that might not necessarily be in love with beaver, but they are in love with the breed beaver. For example, Weyerhaeuser, which is the largest forestry company in the in the world, well, in the United States. Uh, Jamie Nettles is their lead hydrologist, and they're out there doing contour forestry practices and using these lesser desirable slash off of the main logs that are their main value. Instead of bulldozing them into piles and burning them, they're going out in their contour forestry management strategies, and they're laying that brush down on strategy, doing beaver biomimicry all the way up the hill. And they're not doing it to keep sediments out of the creek, although that's a positive outcome. They're not doing it to, to make better water quality. They're doing it because those trees need soil and water. And if you keep that soil and water on the land through these contour forestry practices that are actually written into a bunch of the forestry BMPs, as, as the foresters know, um, they're making more money. They're, they're growing better trees faster by, by managing their soil and their, their water using beaver biomimicry. So I think there's a lot of opportunities there. So that might be a foot in the door and get them to start looking at, you know, if they're trying to do carbon sequestration or, or, or anything, they might be looking at water management. And as we all know, the beaver, you know, are, they excel in that and they've been doing it longer than all of us have. So thank you. Um, my name is Lizzie and I work for the Idaho Conservation League and I came here with Lily from Idaho. Um, and I just wanted to say that Sandy, you had a really good point um, and kind of going off of that, 
uh, I didn't care about um, beaver issues until I learned about the salmon issue in the Pacific Northwest. And so I think that more advocacy with certain groups like salmon conservation, I think you could even go all the way to do, um, you know, forestry, like Sandy said, um, while also being able to do like wolf populations or uh, bear conservation groups. And I just think that all of them end up relating to one another. Um, and then the other thing that I think is really important that could um, be better represented would be tribal voices and being able to connect with coalitions um, who would probably provide a really untapped resource. Um, there was one presentation about it uh, and th about the Tula, Tula Lip people, and that was really impressive. And so um, I just thought that was a really good point and being able to bring in, I know that the Lummi Nation in Washington and the Shoshone Bannock people in Idaho both have stories about the beaver. And so um, if you're able to work with them, I think that would be a much easier way to get uh, tribal people and tribal youth involved. Thank you. Uh, hi, Gloria Charland. I'm with the uh, Manitou Creek Watershed in uh, northeastern Illinois. Um, yeah, I'm going to kind of ramble here. So um, our watershed is uh, has some agriculture. It has a lot of forest preserves. The, uh, the best locations for doing uh, beaver restoration is in our, our uh, forest preserves. And we've, we've tried to talk to these people who are all uh, conservationists, naturalists, uh, forestry people, and uh, they just want to remove beavers. And, and when we talk to them about uh, re-meandering re our, our channelized stream that, you know, polluting our, uh, our, wet, our, our lakes with nutrients and sediments, uh, they, they come up with uh, million-dollar projects to, to re-meander streams uh, but but I, I'd really like to see um, how do we how do we educate these professionals who should already know this stuff um, that's so Scott McGill with the ecotone partner in crime here with Mike um, you know just I like to dot connect I'm still working on everything that I'm taking in but um, you know I learned yesterday that outdoor recreation is somehow the largest industry in the U.S. And I'm, I'm working on this this idea that, like, we need to, to really focus as a, on a national level of meeting people where they are, right, and what make, makes people tick. And, you know, and then I saw Mike's talk, and, gee, one-third cost share for a flow device doesn't sound all that impressive to me, but it works, you know? So, um you got to meet people where they are, and hate to say it, but you know, financial marketing. This works for me. This gets a, a rate of return that I wasn't realizing before. That's meeting people where they are. You know, it's a it's a language that people understand, right? And um, it gets you right through the 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 beaver jokes and the cackles, and the, that's a crazy idea to like, wait, I'm gonna I'm gonna do okay. I'm gonna do better with this. Um, you know, we've convinced landowners that, um, you know, by having beaver habitat, they, they have a, um, a waterfowl lease potential. And I don't know if any of you have uh, waterfowlers in your family, but these guys, it's a huge problem. It's a disease. Like, these guys, you know, they spend twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year on, be on, on hunting, or on leases. Well, duck, you know, beaver ponds are the best duck habitat out there. They co-evolve with beaver just like everything else. Um, you know, as far as organizationally, you know, national, Mike, and you're thinking huge. I like, you know, um, I'm, I'm trying to catch up here. But, you know, it's great to file lawsuits. It's great to, you know, leverage these these federal programs. But, um, you know, let's, let's eat the elephant one bite at a time. Um, you know, there's magic in small, too. And putting together a group, and and the other idea is that um, you know, as we tend to sort of overestimate what we can knock out in a week, but we way underestimate what we can accomplish in a year or two years. And keeping that in the back of our mind is, I think, something that um, will help this this national push. Um, you know, I was at a uh, 
a J.P. Morgan financial event. I'm not sure why I was invited, but anyway, I was there. I felt really out of place. I was the only one with a D next to my name, I'm pretty sure, but whatever. And, um, you know, the, the speaker um, down in Baltimore was talking about, you know, the big impacts financially, you know. You know, blockchain came up. Climate change came up, which I was glad about. Um, but, you know, we were in downtown Baltimore, and I said, hey, bro, look out the window here. Like, you know, 100 years from now, this is all underwater. Um, and it, he started paying attention, and then we started talking about, of course, I cracked the seal and the beaver, right? And, um, and I got these guys to pay attention, you know, so th they had no idea. So we're still early innings here, you know. People have no idea um, that beaver are out there providing all these wonderful ecosystem services. Um, people think that beaver are just like an otter or a, <coughs> um, a muskrat, right? Um, but they're so different, right? Um, organizational goals, you know, um, okay, objective, key results, you know, Sarah was, what's your purpose? And then build the organization around that, right? Don't build your organization first and then figure out what you want to do. And then uh, a few people recently, like this is the first time anybody's that I've heard, and I haven't been to all the sessions, indigenous cultures. Uh, if you haven't picked up the book, Beaver, Bison, Horse, it's a good one. Um, you know, pedestrian cultures that were, were, you know, inhabited this continent not too long ago. Um, you know, it was interesting to me that some tribes in drier climes, their culture, it was, it was like um, taboo to hunt or eat a beaver. Um, and then you get to, to, to cultures in wetter climes and they had, they didn't, they didn't have any care in the world. Like beaver mean nothing to us. So in the East, yeah, you want us to trap beaver for you by the millions? Sure. But you got out to the Blackfoot, even though they, it was very lucrative, potentially they, they would not do it. It was like, you know, our culture sort of eating a dog. Um, so because why? Because their lives depended on it. And, it, you know, whether we like it or not, out west, we, you know, you're, we're, our lives and livelihoods and our properties are going to depend on the beaver. So that's, that's a huge shift um, intellectually, culturally. And then lastly, um, and these are in no sequential order. This is scattered. But um, use some of these existing programs. Like Brian was saying, there's all this money available. Um, you know, for years, our, our company would, would incentivize and, and get landowners to participate in the CREP program, you know, get paid to, and you get a rental payment if you plant trees and you retire that ground. Well, isn't it 100x more valuable if there's beaver habitat there? So, you know, there, there's, there's some places where we can make incremental but important change just by adding beaver as a, uh, as a new BMP to what's already out there as far as existing federal and state programs. Thanks, Scott. Hi, my name is Ramsey. Um, I'm from Albuquerque, New Mexico, and taught at the University of New Mexico for a long time, but anyways, I'm retired. And I discovered beavers by taking a species extinction course through the art department. It was an interdisciplinary course open across the campus. The stu I was twice as old as everybody. Um, and the students were nursing and law and city planning and architecture. Um, it was in conjunction with a two-year-long project identifying species near extinction on the Rio Grande. And they identified 30 artists from Colorado down to the Gulf to work to identify their species that was near extinction um, and to work for a year and a half on a body of artwork. It was assembled and put in three different venues in the city of Albuquerque. And uh, the university tied the curriculum into those exhibitions. And that's how I discovered beavers that are labeled functionally extinct in New Mexico. And uh, they're in the northern area up near Colorado. But as you get south of Santa Fe and as the river is dying, as it proceeds south, there's less and less, if any at all. But um, I tell you this story because it's kind of a local story and it's a way to say that we should loop in other sectors 
and a lot of the talks that I was listening to was about the PR <laughs> and about messaging. So I do think there's a lot of uh, groups of people out there that can help with the identification and the PR and the messaging. Um, and the last part is your university may or may not, but check into it. Um, our university has a master's of fine arts in land arts and an undergraduate degree in art and ecology. So these are students that are pursuing the arts with an emphasis on ecology. So they may be a resource in your area. Hi there, I'm Melanie Arsenault. I'm doing uh, research up in Northern Quebec, about in Canada. That's about six hours north of Montreal in a kind of wild and frontiers kind of region where there is not many uh, big cities or anything. So I'm coming from a different context. My research um, is on beaver diet. We want to do, we want to use a stable isotope analysis on organs, which I collected from carcasses from local trappers. So uh, beavers are extremely um, abundant up there. They're in every stream, every lakes. So just to bring idea or different perspective to this kind of group is um, I was coming into that research I was like oh my god I'm gonna go meet a bunch of trappers like I'm gonna go and teach them a thing or two about <laughs> beavers and conservation turns out they taught me a lot more and um, they're the people on the front line um, wanting to save habitats they're uh, I, I found out they're really like militants about like forest conservation against like major uh, logging and whatnot. And that's uh, part of the context and the problem up there is uh, lots of beaver conflicts with, with the mining industry, the forest industries. There's about, if I'm not mistaken, there's about 300 kilometers of forest roads being built every year in that region. So that means a lot of culverts. <laughs> um, and the trappers, of course, they get called a lot for nuisance beavers. There's no, uh, they're the first people that cities or companies call for nuisance beavers. And I found out that more and more they suggest themselves, they go and install, promote, install, suggest flow devices instead of uh, just simple trapping. And they, they teach people that, well, I can come and remove that beaver and get $20 for the pelt, but I'm going to be back and back and back because beavers are abundant. So just an idea, like, uh, as a people to bring to, to the table. And the idea came when we talked about uh, forest management and whatnot. Well, there's, yeah, in where I come from or where I'm studying, the forestry, the mining industry, and the trappers could have, um, if they're willing to, of course, it could be a big clash sometimes. But just as a different perspective, they could also uh, benefit from that education. Because the trappers I've met, also, they first one that taught me to um, to have respect for the wildlife, to not over trap, to respect, you know, when they're having, when they're rearing, when they're having the babies and not to only take a certain amount. So there is always a healthy population on land. So just a different perspective and ideas. And my research kind of also involves the First, Nat first Nation communities around there too. So, um, all of these people reminded me that, yeah, it's always good to have as a discussion group. Thanks, Melanie. Uh, one quick comment. You know, Barbara Jones in the Hunt Room had talked about that where there's the pragmatic approach and then there's the idealistic approach, and we need both. We need that vision of the idealists, but the the pragmatic ones who are taking those little steps, bridging, making those bridges and moving things forward towards that goal. But uh, we need to engage as much as we can in our divisive world. And th so thanks for making that point. I'm Deborah Cronister, and I'm this. Hey, so <laughs> this idea um, of multiple ideas uh, from multiple uh, lectures today, um, has to do with the macro and the micro and this big picture of doing this uh, national beaver coalition. How do you organize that? How do you get the people who are all specialist in their little area and their little county in their state and their whatever to be able to act, be active in this national coalition? And I was thinking of something that Brian told me uh, we were had been discussing was um, 
you know, our state boundaries are so illogical and our county boundaries are so illogical. And what if this organization, this national working group were to be divided along watersheds, major watersheds, sub watersheds, sub, sub, sub. And then what if instead of having, you know, this state voting for this and that state voting for that, what if the, the particular, everybody who lived in that watershed ends up with a vote, an opinion, a something, and that ends up with some serious political power someday. And everybody in that watershed is, is on the same page because they're all invested. They're not worried about, uh, yeah, I mean, the people who are upstream are certainly going to be hopefully compassionate about the people downstream, and the people downstream are certainly invested in the people's uh, lives upstream, uh, whereas, you know, a different river shed, you know, you may not matter so much. Hey, uh, Josh Deborah, I'm a biologist with Wildlife and Heritage on Maryland. Um, I, I just want to encourage everyone in the room to, I guess, think about community-based solutions uh, that, that foster public buy-in. Um, I, I see wildlife as an increasingly politicized uh, topic in the United States, unfortunately. And, um, you know, I think anyone that knows anything about politics realizes that there's back doors and there's sneaky ways to do things. Um, and, you know, I think we re really need to be careful not to be disingenuous uh, when we're talking to the public and we're, we're, when we're talking to user groups. Um, because, you know, it, you, we could very well, you know, sneak something in that may be ben beneficial, but when the pendulum swings back, it, it really hurts. Um, and, you know, that's something that the wildlife management communities learned a couple times the hard way. Or if you look at the case study of, like, Red Wolves and Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge, um, you know, without the, the public buy-in, um, you know, you had a, you had a reproducing uh, population of red wolves established there, um, but they had nowhere to go outside of the refuge um, without support from the public um, and, and the neighboring community. So I, I'd, I'd encourage everyone to think about um, leaving a seat at the table for everyone, uh, you know, like trappers. Uh, in, in to, I think we need to be careful not to construct false dichotomies. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of different perspectives and points of view. Um, I interact with a diverse constituency um, on a daily or weekly basis, um, and I, I think that you know when you approach things with an open mind, you'd be surprised at uh, how mu how much we all have in common. Um, you know, I, I don't think that that trappers and environmentalists and biologists and uh, you know, geologists, hydrologists, what have you. Uh, there's, there's no mutual exclusivity there. I, I think that there, there's a lot of um, intersectionality and, and shared interests, even if we may disagree on a few things. So I just want to leave you all with that. Probably a good time for me. Um, I'm going to come over here, so I'm not turning my back to too many people. My name is Elizabeth Miller. I'm a staff wildlife biologist with the USDA Wildlife Services. Um, I say that with some trepidation, but I think this is a good time to go ahead and, and say something. There's a lot of um, words or phrases that I spend a lot of time thinking about that have just been mentioned, you know, PR and messaging, pragmatism, uh, trapping, and I've decided to try to limit my comment right now to a question for the group. Um, how many of you are unfamiliar with wildlife services? Okay, so that means most of you are. Um, for Yes, it is. USDA APHIS Wildlife Services. People mostly know us for trapping or lethal control of wildlife. However, I promise you, we are much more diverse in the services provided. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, for those of you who are familiar with wildlife services, how many are, of you are familiar with our non-lethal initiative? We're currently in the third year of that. I know Zach knows. Zach was very pivotal in that. Thanks again. Um, so to me and to Wildlife Services, I think that a national working group would give us the chance to explain a little bit more about what we do and capitalize on other people's efforts and collaborate more. Our non-lethal initiative, uh, the first two years, was exclusively focused on preventing 
or reducing more pragmatically, since we're being pragmatic, uh, reducing large carnivore depredation on livestock um, in specific regions of North America. This third year, we're expanding to include non-lethal beaver conflict reduction. Um, so I think it's important for people to know that. I think it's important for people to um, give us some room to maybe share what we're learning, but also let us learn from y'all because uh, we are a federal program, but we have a program in each state. And sometimes those states work in much greater isolation from each other than you might expect from a federal program. Um, that's kind of by design because each state is faced with such different regulations and, and kind of local um, restrictions. So it's helpful to to not have to learn everything from the ground up within our own program. So we really want to lean on other communities, and we've seen success in that model when in the first two years of this initiative working with large carnivores. You know, instead of working in isolation, we've worked with groups that historically maybe we had a more adversarial relationship with, and it's been very beneficial. Um, and when I say that, I mean for us, for NGOs, for wildlife, for agriculture, um, for all parties involved. So um, if anyone wants to talk about anything else later, I'm happy to field some of those questions, but I want to just kind of put that plug for, for what a national working group could could mean for wildlife services and the communities that we um, provide services to. Thanks. Alexa Whipple, thank you for standing up. I didn't catch your name, but that it's always brave to stand up and say, I'm representing something that a lot of people don't like, but we're doing some new stuff and please try to have an open mind. And I'll be one of the first to say, I work with USDA APHIS, Methow Beaver Project, Mike Linnell is the state director. He's part of the Washington Beaver Working Group and has done amazing things to move non-lethal management forward in our state. And he's actually helping fund coexistence work with small groups like mine and Elisa's with Beavers Northwest under Ben Dittbrenner before. So that, I wanted to work off of Josh's comment too. I've, I've sat quietly <laughs> over here, which I'm not very good at when it comes to beavers, but I think a national working group makes so much sense on some levels, and then other issues, like Allison said, have to be done on a local or more localized level to really have an impact, because the priorities in every region, every county, every habitat, um, which Washington is blessed to have so many different kinds of habitat, the priorities are, are all a little different, if not quite different, in some of those places. So, and a lot of our states, have ultimate control over the wildlife population's management of them. It's not going to come from the feds how they're managed. But the funding resources, like so many people I've talked about, can be potentially garnered a little more easily if we had a national working group working on making that money more available and qualify our, our projects qualified for that funding on all the different levels, USDA, APHIS, CREPS, um, US and NRDS, you know, all the different places, EPA, uh, ecology groups, it, it's just so big at the federal level. And as so many, including Izzy, have managed to get across to all of us that we really struggle with capacity. So to, to then take a Washington Beaver Working Group where we already don't spend enough time as a group interacting with each other to make state policy and um, ideas a reality. I honestly can't imagine right now joining a national working group to try to focus on, even though I think it's necessary. So therein lies a conundrum that maybe groups like Animal Welfare Institute could look at sponsoring staff time, you know, of like individuals' time to join for limited periods of a national working group who are interested, of course to say, can you dedicate 10, 15% of your time, and what is that worth, to a national working group for one year, two year terms, and then you can bring state ideas to the national level and then back down again, national to the state level, and where they're appropriate and how you can apply them. So that's just one thought, because I, I mean, I have so much to say about Washington and the in incredible progressive work that's been done there, 
and that not every other state has to reinvent that wheel. Like we are very open to sharing everything we've tried, what's worked, what's not worked. Uh, and we want to do that, but it's not going to be the same in every state, and that's why national doesn't work on the every part of that. I could keep talking, but I really wanted to talk about the art piece because <laughs> one, I'm going to mention that and then I'll sit down. One of the biggest challenges is that we are such a diverse national community. Same things don't speak to everyone. We don't all speak the same language. Um, we don't see have the same perspective on everything. But one thing can uni unify everyone is art. I mean, it's one of those things that everyone can find their own perspective or interpretation of it, but often we all find the same interpretation if it's, it's really obvious or done well or, like, creatively. So that's one of the things we've actually just started with, with a local artist who's also a youth. Um, when I say youth, 20s, she's a youth, so. <laughs> but incredibly imaginative. And we're working on the outreach, which everybody needs for um, helping people understand beavers who have, don't think about beavers at all, which is most people. We are a very passionate but very small sphere of beaver believers. So to get people thinking about it, how do we reach the folks who, we have a large Latino community uh, in my neck of the woods, and just translating stuff, it does, doesn't always even reach over in that way. But if we show imagery, especially artistic imagery, in as many places as possible that, show, that tells the story in and of itself, that can be translated by anyone, uh, ideally, if it's done well. <laughs> so, Anyways, I just wanted to throw that out there, that I think there's a lot of room for artistry in getting the outreach out there around beavers and the incredible benefits they provide in our watersheds, on the landscape, to the human communities, but even more importantly, the biological communities we all depend on and love, and then even more importantly, the water that we all need. So. I just want to respond to that comment on behalf of Brenda, who, who, who can't be with us in person, just to say that the idea of this national working group, I think there's a lot of of legs that the National Association of Wetland Managers has sort of built on this, that we're hopefully going to be utilizing some of that work that's already been developed to sort of grow it from there ideally. So I know that she would want to say something on that regard, so just going to speak out on her behalf to sort of think about what, what we already have, even if it's not that, we don't, it doesn't seem like that much, that there has been that groundwork that that organization has done that we're really looking to, to utilize that to elevate this and take this further. So. Hi, I'm Tony Sturm. I'm from New York. Um, I have a medical background, and I guess I'm an amateur ecologist and beaver lover. Um, so my thoughts on some kind of national coalition, I think the underlying phenomena that talks about what we get from beavers, other than those of us who have heartstrings that tend to bleed when we look at them and think how cute they are, are that they create wetlands, and it's the wetlands that do the bountiful things. And the issue with a national coalition is that depending on your region, that completely affects the type of ecological and climate change issues that one deals with. So out west, there's issues of drought and fire. In the Midwest and certainly the Northeast, we deal with floods. Um, maybe in, as somebody mentioned, in southern Arizona, there's actually a paucity of beavers, and they're somewhat endangered, which kind of blows my mind, because for us in the rest of the country, they're considered vermin. Um, so I, I think a national program, and I sort of like the the concept of a national be beaver biobank coalition focuses on wetland enhancement, and then the wetland enhancement creates opportunities for flood prevention, drought mitigation, which includes fire, and water cleansing. And water cleansing is what happens on the East Coast in 
I don't know where he is right now, in terms of um, fisheries, bays, estuaries. Um, it also impacts, I think, the Midwest and any agricultural regions where you have, where you're dealing with agricultural runoff into water systems. It also impacts lake and estuary organizations that are dealing with clean water. Um, and I think this, the science behind carbon sequestration things is perhaps still a little bit new, um, but I think any national coalition needs to be divided in some way regionally, and whether it's by watersheds or by the type of issues that each region faces, because that's going to that's going to alter the type of stakeholders that come to your table when you're trying to reach out and, and broaden your base. And a national coalition, it could serve as a clearinghouse for public relations and how we talk about the issues that we face in whatever our region is. It can talk about how do we garner stakeholder buy-in and who are our stakeholders. It can help with funding and it can then ultimately help with policy because I think the bottom line to creating a difference is to change policy, whether it's, you know, um, exchanging um, carbon, um, you know, exchanging your, your carbon production or exchanging wetland destruction for wetland creation, um, however you want to look at it. But ultimately, I think the goal is policy change and that's probably at a joint level of both state and federal, but I think a national coalition could sort of, that that could be the ultimate goal that they would serve as, um, as a real resource and sort of clearinghouse for all the rest of us kind of scattered around. Okay, uh, just another quick comment. This is a follow-up on uh, uh, Scott's comment on the duck hunters and then the other comments on the trappers. Several people made comments on trappers. And I think that being inclusive is imperative for any sort of national working group. I'd like to highlight that bringing people like Elizabeth and the USDA is, is actually a really valuable skill. And having better communications, better partnerships, and better engagement with groups like the USDA or FEMA or the Environmental Protection Agency or even the Bureau of Reclamation um, and the BLM, as well as Ducks Unlimited, Trout Unlimited, and Nature Conservancy, they can all bring great assets in a different perspective. Let me also highlight that Ducks Unlimited, Trout Unlimited, and the Nature Conservancy have all been incredibly effective at winning these USDA RCPP grants. So they have, they already have a path. They know how to address some of these federal funds and partnering with those groups that in many cases align very closely with the people in this room help us not have to recreate the wheel and not have to find all these grant writers. They're already doing it. So I think it's important. We need our own grant writers. And when you're applying for grants, the more hooks you have in the water, the more likely you are to catch a fish. But we also don't need to recreate the wheel. I think it's good to be inclusive. And I think it's really valuable to understand what these federal agencies are doing. Because also as a federal employee, I know that many people don't really understand what the EPA does, and I know for a fact many people don't know what the USDA does, and they're out there, they're really, for the most part, trying to do exceptional good, as well as all these other agencies. So I just wanted to highlight the fact that being inclusive is going to make this group be better at solving problems using the dialectic uh, process. Thank you, and thank you, everyone. We have to close up this session now, but just recognize that the Beaver Institute has been a largely volunteer organization. We're expanding. I'm a funnel. Use me. We're, 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 go we're enthusiastically being so ambitious about what we want to accomplish. And a lot of that has to do about realizing this community and doing really seemingly impossible things together. And so I'm a funnel. I am here and um, we're going to be in touch. I'm going to be in touch with all of you in the coming weeks. So um, thank you all so very much, and I look forward to seeing where this conversation can go, and uh, uh, I'll see you on the other side. <laughs>